Today, we're faced with a highly organized, structured, and determined enemy moving against us like never before to control everything we do, including how much money we can make, how much energy we can use, what kind of foods we can eat, and even what we're allowed to think and say. And this enemy is described to us in the Bible as a seven-headed beast representing a one-world political government seeking to devour the entire earth. And you know what? This beast isn't only after political control. It's after your soul as well. What can I as an individual do about this? And the answer generally given is to be involved. And being involved is a great answer, but something more needs to be done. And that something more is for us all to become educated in God's word so that we know who the enemy is and how we are to defeat him. More specifically, we need to learn how to count the number of the beast. And we're gonna learn how to do that in this video. If we try to take this beast on ourselves, we will lose. And if we put our trust in a single political party or a man to save us, we'll be let down as well. But if we do it God's way, we are guaranteed victory. I can say this because I've read the back of the book and it foretells of a group of overcomers who did it God's way, celebrating their victory over the beast. What a time of celebration this is going to be. You know, many people get excited when their favorite football team wins the Super Bowl or their favorite baseball team wins the World Series. But this is going to be the real thing. This is going to be the greatest victory celebration of all times. And imagine standing there with your head up high, knowing that you never once gave in to this godless world government or to Satan himself. And you're standing there as an overcomer, having achieved victory over all evil. But in order to get to that celebration, there are some details here that we must not overlook. Notice it didn't just say they had victory over the beast, period. It also said that they had victory over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. So these things must be important for us to understand because how are we to overcome something if we don't even know what it is? This brings up another point. Many Christians are taught today that all they have to do is believe, be saved, and get raptured. There has never been a bigger lie than this because Christ's main message to the churches in Revelation chapter two through three was that they were to overcome, not just to believe, but to put their words into action. In fact, our Lord stressed this so much that the word overcome was used 17 times in the book of Revelation. We could go on and read many more places where this word is used. And it's fascinating to read about the many different awards that are to be given to the overcomers. That is to say, Christian overcomers. But again, achieving the victory takes action on our part, not just saying that we believe. And part of that action begins with acquiring knowledge. So what about this image, the mark, and the number of his name? What does all this mean? And 
Before we get into too many of the details, I think it's important that we first read a very significant verse related to all of this. Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. And it reads, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. What does all this mean? Well, let's break it down. The Greek word for count is fe fidso. It's from New Testament word 5586. It means to use pebbles in enumeration, i.e. generally to compute. And it stems from the word se lafaho. And that's from the base of New Testament word 5567. It means to manipulate, to verify by contact, figuratively to search for. Keep that in your mind to search for. Okay, so where does this get us then? Well, think about it. What is the first thing that a general does before he sends out his army to war? He sizes up the enemy. He gathers as much intelligence about him as he can by reading books, news articles, and any other source of information so that he can find out what his enemy's strengths and weaknesses are. And you know what, in this battle, the spiritual war that we are in today, these same principles of war still apply. And he gave us our mission focus. Hey, we're sent here to tread upon the serpents, to defeat our enemies. You know, there's so many Christians today that have this pacifist mentality where um, they just think, well, we're just sent here to, to talk about love and, and uh, kindness and gentleness. And, mm -hmm. you know, those are things that we do as Christians, but we still have an enemy to fight. Right. And I've, I've said before, if all you're doing is talking about love, 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 the, the person you may end up loving instead of God may be Satan himself. Right. Okay, so we're told that the number of the beast is 666. So does that mean we are to count from 1 to 666 and we're good to go? No, anyone can do that. You see, numbers have a spiritual meaning in Scripture. For example, 1 means unity, 2 means witness, 3 means divine completeness, 5 means grace, 7 means spiritual completeness, and so on. If you have a companion Bible, Appendix 10 will teach you the basics of this. If you don't have one, you can get one by going to our website at christianovercomers.com. You know, the companion Bible is simply a tool that I wouldn't go without. It's that valuable. But back to the number 666. You see, numbers have a special meaning to our enemies as well. And they just love this number. 666 six, six, and many other combinations of numbers including the number 6. And if you look closely, you'll see that this number 6 is worked into many of their symbols, writings, and teachings. Knowing this fact helps us identify who some of our enemies are and in fact it helps us peel past many of the other layers till we reach that core group of deceivers who are giving power unto the beast. And after some study, you'll find that the leaders and teachers of what's called the New Age Movement are a part of this group. And their goal is to prepare the world to accept the false Christ when he appears, claiming to usher in a so-called New Age of Utopia, where we all live together in harmony, sharing the world's resources. In a book that exposes the New Age movement, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, author Constance Cumbie shows how this movement has infiltrated almost every area of society. And concerning their use of the number 666, she says on page 22 that New Agers consider the 666 a sacred number. Those who so freely use the number 666 
honestly believe they are sending signals to outer space or to what they call superior intelligences which they believe inhabit our planet. They are asking those superior intelligences to come in and bring a new advanced civilization. They believe that the more times and the more places that the numeral 666 are used, the quicker that a new civilization will come. But why do they use the number 666? Well, Dr. Bollinger points out in his book, Number in Scripture, that if 6 is the number of secular or human perfection, then 666 is a more emphatic expression of the same fact. And 666 is the concentrated expression of it. 666 is therefore the trinity of human perfection. The perfection of imperfection, the culmination of human pride in independence from God and opposition to his Christ. He goes on further to say that 666 was the secret symbol of the ancient pagan mysteries connected with the worship of the devil. It is today the secret connecting link between those ancient mysteries and their modern revival in spiritualism, theosophy, etc. The efforts of the great enemy are now directed towards uniting all into one great whole. That great whole that Dr. Bollinger was referring to is the seven-headed beast or the new world order that we're seeing arising today. They want to blend all governments and all religions into one. And when Dr. Bollinger mentions spiritualism and theosophy, he is referring to the New Age movement that has kept this secret symbol alive and well. For they believe that we, as citizens of the world, can create our own utopia on earth without the God of the Bible and without the Lord Jesus Christ. This is that same lie that Satan espoused to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That lie which says we don't need to obey God's commandments because we too can be gods. And if you take a look at all the false religions and philosophies upon earth today, you'll see the same lie of human perfection repeated through them all, including the philosophies of socialism, communism, and progressivism. You know, if you want to be an overcomer, Never put your trust in man. Trust in God and always, always do your own thinking. For man is an imperfect creature and can never be right 100% of the time. You know, it's great to have teachers and mentors, but you must understand the material for yourself because then and only then will you be able to stand upon your beliefs. Because if you have to answer someone by saying, well, Pastor Ben said this or that, you're not going to get very far. But if you can tell them it says so in this chapter and in this verse and that this is the truth, you may be able to win over a soul. There is something even more that we need to learn about this number, the number 666, or the number of the beast. And when you get into it, you'll find that there are no numbers in the Greek or Hebrew languages in which the Bible was written. You see, letters were used for numbers, for each letter had its own numerical value. For instance, let's pretend that the English language was the same way. Here is what it would look like. A would equal 1 b would equal 2, c would equal 3, and so on till you get to j would equal 10, 
K would equal 20, L would equal 30, and so on till you get to 100. T would equal 100, U would equal 200, V would equal 300, and so on. So if we wanted to make a number like 223, we would simply combine the three letters UKC. This method is how the number 666 was determined, for 666 in the Greek manuscripts is actually made up of three different Greek letters, Ki, Kasi, and Stigma, which is 600 plus 60 plus 6 to equal 666. Okay, so what's the significance of this? Well, the first and last letters, Chi and Stigma, here are actually identical to the first and last letters of the word Christ. But in between these letters is the letter Kasi, and it's a very interesting letter. As you can see, it looks very much like a serpent, doesn't it? Because these three letters represent the serpent trying to take the place of Christ as Messiah. Yes, Satan trying to be the savior of the world. And it's no accident that the symbol of the serpent can be found among almost every pagan religion that has ever existed. So when we take a step back and look at how 666 was originally written, we can see that the serpent is being pointed out to us in a big way as it is the center of attention here. So it becomes obvious that knowing more about the serpent is part, is part of how we are to count the number of the beast. How do we do that? Well, a good place to start is by going to the parables which our Lord spoke, because he used many of these to reveal many mysteries to us, including the mystery of the ancient serpent. Who, so who's the serpent then? You said that the, that the woman represented, mm -hmm. you know, the Christians or good, the good seed. Good point. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people when they read uh, Genesis there, they read about the serpent and they think, they picture, you know, a snake slithering around in the Garden of Eden talking to people, <laughs> talking to Adam and Eve. And we know that the serpent is merely a symbol of Satan because of his cunningness, his flashiness, his shining uh, um, appearance as a, you know, because he used to be one of God's mighty angels in the first world age. But in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it is verse 8, 9, or 10, somewhere around there, it just, it states that, uh, the serpent is just another one of Satan's names, mm. along with the dragon mm -hmm. um, and uh, the devil and so forth. Sure. So let's turn to one of these parables in Matthew chapter 13, verse 34. And these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. But some would say, I didn't think Christ kept any secrets. Yep, he does. Because he only wants certain people to understand. He only wants those who are seeking, who are praying, who are who are diligently asking for wisdom. He only wants those people to understand. And you know what? In this parable that Christ just got done speaking contains the mystery of that serpent and the number of the beast.
In this parable of the tares, Christ explains how evil got sown into this world. It was sown into this world by the wicked one way back in the beginning with Cain, who was of his father, Satan. And some would say, I've never heard something that crazy before. Then I'd say in return, have you never read Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, where God says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. So describe um, for our listeners the word seed. What, is, mm-hmm. what does seed mean? I mean, is that are we talking about literal children then? Yeah, the word seed, uh, I know in the Greek, this word seed is used, and it's actually the Greek word sperma which means a male sperm mm-hmm. or male seed. But in the uh, in the Old Testament, the, seed, the word seed is often used to represent, like you're saying, offspring, children. Mm-hmm. And that's what it means, you know. And uh, it, it's, it's used that way, you know, so you could actually kind of track it throughout history. It's that same seed that passes on throughout uh, generation to generation. It's a, fam- it's a family uh, genealogy is what it is. Okay. So this sounds kind of like uh, when Christ taught about Matthew 13 with the parable mm-hmm. of the sower, even more specifically the yeah. parable of the tares. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and that parable, the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, Christ revealed to us and to his disciples exactly who's been behind all this evil that's been going on in the world today. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, obviously we see the liberals today and, and we see that they work for the dark side, so to speak. They're always pushing anti-Christian uh uh, programs in government, mm-hmm. anti-Christian thoughts, and even persecuting Christians. But the liberals, most liberals you come in contact with today are um, are kind of the uh, uh, mere pawns in the hand of the serpent, if you would. They, they don't really know what's going on. They're just, they're deceived by the serpent. And the serpent and his people, the mm-hmm. serpent's seed, are the brains behind the operation. They're the brains behind the evil. I mean, that's your real evil people. I mean, they plan, they strategize how they are going to deceive. Because if you go back to what a serpent does, his method of attack is always um, is the art of deception. Mm. It's got to be elusive. It's got to maneuver. And uh, that's what you see kind of behind, uh, well, a lot of people know of it today as uh, shadow governments. A government within a government Mm -hmm. and behind that you would see the children of the serpent some may notice if they look at your website that there is a picture of a foot or a heel that's stepping on the head of a serpent Mm -hmm. what does this picture symbolize well that's a picture of uh, Christ's foot crushing the head of the serpent and it's and it's uh, it's a description or a picture of the first prophecy um, in the entire Bible, the prophecy in Genesis 3 verse 15, where it states that there would be a war between the serpent seed and the woman seed, and that the serpent seed would actually bruise the heel of the woman, but yet the woman seed, which would be Christ and Christians, would bruise or or they would crush the head of the serpent. So that's why we use that as our symbol because you know it's our mission and purpose as a Christian, and um, we were sent here to stand against evil, to be a warrior for the truth, because that's what a Christian overcomer is, is it's a war, uh, Christian overcomers are warriors. Okay. Furthermore, Christ speaks of the serpent seed in Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, where he says, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Christ identified the enemy for us here. They are the children of the serpent. And they've been behind the scenes for many, many centuries, plotting and planning how they might one day take over the world for their daddy, the king serpent, who is none other than Lucifer himself. And when we've peeled away all of the other layers of deception, we always come in contact with this same group of people and their descendants behind most of the world's problems. For they are the arch enemies of God and his people. Do you want to know more about your enemy? Examine the serpent and see how it operates in nature. Then, then you'll be one step closer to victory. 
And, okay. you know, a serpent likes darkness. It likes to hide. It likes to remain undetected, like I mentioned uh, in the introduction. And that's, that's kind of the secret to their power because if, if a serpent gets out in the open, it's vulnerable. You know, it's, it, can be, uh, it can be destroyed. You know, a serpent actually, um, I think when it's taking its prey, many times serpents will, will uh, just stick out their, their tail and wiggle it a little bit so that it's kind of a bait to whether it's a mouse or whatever it's mm -hmm. trying to attack. And that's kind of how the serpent operates today. It's always baiting people, mm -hmm. getting them to come over and see what he has to say. Right. And then... To then get them in a trance. Yep. And that's kind of... I guess you could think of that as how liberals are deceived today. But what about the image and the mark of the beast that we were told to overcome back in Revelation 15 verse 2? Well, we can't cover everything about them in one video, but we can discover something significant related to them. On page 283 of Number in Scripture, Dr. Bollinger states that the number six was stamped on the old mystery. The great secret symbol consisted of the three letters SSS because the letter S in the Greek alphabet was the symbol of the figure six. Alpha 1, Beta 2, Gamma 3, Delta 4, Epsilon 5, but when it came to 6, another letter was introduced. Not the next, the 6 letter Zeta, but a different letter. A peculiar form of S called Stigma. Now the word Stigma means a mark, but especially a mark made by a brand as birthed upon slaves, cattle, or soldiers by their owners or masters, or, or on devotees who thus branded themselves as belonging to their gods. Because back in the day, um, people who devoted themselves to certain pagan gods and, and goddesses actually branded themselves with some kind of symbol depicting their god. The number of the beast was 600 and 66, 666. Right. But that was also a, uh, the equivalent of that in the Greek alphabet was the three letters S in the mm -hmm. Greek, SSS, which um, was used by Isis. It was a symbol of Isis, mm -hmm. as well as being a secret symbol for many other pagan uh, mystery religions. Right. So we see here, it just, it seems like there's a lot of connection to do with commerce, um, you know, one worldism, and that number 666 mm -hmm. in connection with ISIS. So I guess we could say this for sure, that more and more each day as we get into this generation, we're seeing the paganism being revived.
So since we're dealing with the mark of the Antichrist, what symbol would his people carry with them? It doesn't have to be tattooed on them or anything like that. It just has to be a symbol they use for political or religious reasons. Well, in Isaiah 14 verse 12, we are told that Satan's personal name is actually Lucifer, meaning a bright morning star. So it would make sense that some sort of star would be used to symbolize him, wouldn't it? And you know what? It just so happens that the six-pointed star, or hexagram, has been used in pagan worship since the beginning of time, probably first introduced by Cain, who we now know was of his father, the devil. Very interesting. Very interesting. And there are many sources who agree that this star was in use long ago. For example, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia declares that the six-pointed star is of ancient origin, according to the Rosicrucian, and that it was known to the ancient Egyptians, Hindus, Chinese, and Peruvians. In fact, it is possible that the hexagram may have even been the mark that was placed upon Cain in Genesis chapter 4 verse 15. Let's take a look at that verse. And the Lord God said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. This mark was placed upon Cain for his protection. And it is interesting that the hexagram is still used for protection by occultists and New Agers today. It is even used by one of the wealthiest families on earth, the Rothschilds. In fact, the name Rothschild actually means a red shield, specifically referring to a red hexagram as their shield or protector. That should tell us something. Furthermore, on page 38 of the Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated, Dr. Kathy Burns tells us that former Satanist Bill Schnobelin reminds us, in quotes, to the sorcerer, the hexagram is a powerful tool to invoke Satan. A hexagram must be present to call demon forth. In fact, the word hex comes from this emblem. Now, of course, there are many people who use this symbol who have no idea what it truly represents. But just take a look at this star. I mean, there are sixes all over this thing. There are six points, six angles, six sides, and so on. This is definitely a 666 symbol. And we should take note of it because it is part of the key to counting the number of the beast. It's also important to note that in a couple places the Bible does make mention of a certain star used in false worship. Could it be the six-pointed star? Well, let's read and you decide. Acts chapter 7 verse 43. Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rimpham, figures which you made to worship them. And Amos 5.25. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Chion your images, the star, I repeat that, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. Many sources actually say that the word Chion is derived from Cain, bringing us back to the beginning of the serpent's trail. This just gets more interesting as we go on. The six-pointed star is made up of two equilateral triangles. To occultists and New Agers, this represents a balance of forces as well as other things like sexual union, etc. because one triangle is pointing upwards and the other downwards. Well, you get the point. But it's also important to mention that the triangles are the strongest geometric shape, which is why they are often used in building bridges, buildings, 
as well as many other structures. In fact, the strongest and oldest structure on earth, the Great Pyramid, was built in the form of a triangle. And for thousands of years, it withstood earthquakes and many other events. And because it has three angles and three sides, the triangle is often used to represent the Trinity. As Christians, we know that the Trinity is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But let us also be aware that Satan has a Trinity too, for he is always trying to mimic the things of God. And it's also important to note that for every positive there is a negative, because not every symbol that Satan uses were originally his. Some symbols he uses were actually good until he perverted them. I have to add that in as a note of caution because some people get out of hand when dealing with symbols and take things just a little bit too far. But as for Satan's trinity, it is made up of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the three arch enemies of God as revealed to us in the book of Revelation, working together in an attempt to defeat God. It is vital that we understand this evil trinity and how each part operates. We can't simply walk around with rose-colored glasses on only looking at the positive things. We must also look at the negatives so that we can deal with them and overcome them. That being said, let's take a brief look at each of these. We'll start with the dragon. What does the word dragon mean? The Greek word for dragon means a fabulous kind of serpent, perhaps as supposed to fascinate, i.e. to fascinate with lies and deception. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 12, verse 3, where we can read about him. And it reads, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, twelve hundred and sixty days. In Revelation chapter 12, um, which you already mentioned, where it, it names that serpent as Satan, mm -hmm. um, there's a part, I think it's verse 14, and it says that the woman is going to be nourished for a time, a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Correct. What does this mean? Well, that's looking forward to um, the first half, the first three and a half years of the seven year time of the Antichrist. And what he's saying there is that God would protect his people, the remnant of the woman's seed, those that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And, and um, so basically you're looking at uh, Christians being protected from the serpent when he's cast out of heaven for the first uh, three and a half years. And uh, then when you get to the to middle of, when you get to the middle of his seven year reign, then it gets a little dicey for Christians. That's when we need to put our game face on because at that time it's mentioned that many uh, that Satan would begin to um, take uh, many of God's people into captivity have them delivered up and uh, put on trials and so forth. And that period is known, the last three and a half years of the seven years, is known as the Great Tribulation. Verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought, and his angels. Verse 8, 
and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. We see here that the dragon is none other than Satan himself. It's just another one of the names he goes by. But as the dragon, he is the false or anti-father of the evil trinity. For ever since his rebellion in Isaiah chapter 14, he has tried to replace God. He has tried to sit upon his throne. Now we know that Satan at one time was one of the most glorious angels whose name was Lucifer. So obviously he didn't literally have seven heads and ten horns. These things merely represent his power structure consisting of seven kings and ten major dominions. You know, in Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul told us that we were at war against principalities and powers in high places. And this is what he was referring to. He was referring to Satan and his band of fallen angels who make up the powers of the dragon. And don't forget about his seed here on earth as well, because they are very much a part of this dragon as well. For they've been behind the scenes since the time of Cain, snaking around and creating shadow governments to subvert the powers that be. Going back to Genesis 3.15, it said there would be a war between the woman seed, which would be Christ, Christians, and everybody in, in connection with that family, mm -hmm. and the serpent seed. So precise, that's precisely who we're at war against, is the serpent and his children, as well as his dedicated servants. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, uh, well, uh, one guy's been out in the news lately, uh, George Soros, mm -hmm. which you can pretty much document. He's been kind of one of these guys behind the scenes, mm -hmm. manipulating and uh, taking down currencies and, right. and funding all these anti-Christian programs or globalist programs mm -hmm. that are designed to overthrow freedom democracy and so forth and um, and put in its place or teach in its place a, a uh, socialistic one world government. Since we're talking about snaking around, a very interesting representation of the quest of the serpent for world dominion is the symbol for the Theosophical Society. Notice how the serpent forms a circle around a six-pointed star with its tail in its mouth. This is what's called a Euroboros. Oftentimes, a dragon is used for this as well. And it means that the serpent, or the dragon, will one day encompass all. So to sum this up, you can kind of think of the dragon as the man behind the curtain pulling the strings. Let's move on to the beast. The word for beast in the New Testament is Greek word Number 2342, Therion, and it means a dangerous animal, or it has been translated a venomous wild beast. And that's exactly what this beast is to the peoples of the world. It's a dangerous tyranny seeking to devour the souls of men. So let's turn to Revelation 13, where this is all explained, where it mentions this beast. Revelation 13. Verse 1, and it reads, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. After reading this, it becomes apparent that this beast represents the Antichrist and his false kingdom on earth, otherwise known as the New World Order. Thus the beast makes up part of the evil trinity which tries to replace the Son of God, because he will come in claiming to be Savior of the world. In fact, Daniel 11 tells us that he will come in, saying that he has come to bring peace and and prosperity to all. He wants to spread the wealth and that he has the solutions to all of the world's problems and most, most of the world will buy in unto it. Just as Dr. Bollinger stated on page 426 of his book, Commentary on Revelation. 
In quotes, he is not in any way a terror to men, but full of blandishments, attractions, allurements, and activities which will all be put forth in the interests of human greatness and happiness. It will be Satan's brief millennium, in which mankind will, by every art and artifice, be made happy. It will be a time of peace and progress for the whole world. Great secrets of nature will be discovered. Evil angels will be the teachers, and deceiving demons the guides of mankind. Great inventions and discoveries will be made, and turned to the utmost possible account. Philanthropy will be the governing principle of the world and of the church. The great ethical revival is at our doors. Its advent is announced by the foremost preachers of the day. All this is preparing the way for the man of sin, and the lawless one, who shall be a law unto himself and unto the whole world. Men will delight in him and regard him as the greatest benefactor the world has ever known. Kings will, will gladly owe him suzerainty, and behind all will be Satan himself, swaying the hearts, tongues, and energies of thousands of willing agents. But notice from Revelation chapter 13, 1 and 2, that the beast has a power structure as well, very similar to that of the dragon. Whereas much of the dragon's power structure is hidden to us, the beast's power structure will be out in the open. It will be a visible political government made up of ten kings who will rule the world with the beast, as Revelation chapter 17 explains to us. And we may be very, very close to that time. We were warned by our Lord that false Christs and false prophets shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. And there is one particular false prophet who will come and try and do just that. So let's analyze him by turning to Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. This second beast represents the false prophet. Now obviously, when he appears, he won't really have two horns coming out of his head either. This is just symbolism being used to help us count the number of the beast. He speaks like a dragon because it is the dragon who's behind all of this. If you remember from 13 verse 2, the dragon was behind the first beast as well. Let's read further to verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. You see how tight-knit this trio is? They're working together in unity to deceive you, if that were possible. Let's go to 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. You know, just because someone can perform miracles does not mean that they are good. Remember, Satan is supernatural and he has powers as well. And they don't make him good. Continuing on to verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to know what his image is. You have to know what his mark is. And you also have to know the number of his name. Because if you don't know what these things are, how are you going to achieve the victory over them? Right. And this is all part of counting the, the number of the beasts, is knowing all these different parts. 
because uh, there are many types of these mentioned uh, in the Old Testament as well. And Dan, I believe it's Daniel chapter two. Mm -hmm. There's an exact prototype, if you would, of the image of this beast mm -hmm. and uh, the mark of the beast. There's a prototype of that uh, when God placed the mark upon Cain in the Garden of Eden. What can we glean about these passages concerning the false prophet? Well, we know he will be a religious teacher with a considerable amount of power and influence. And we know he will also be able to perform many miracles like making fire come down from heaven and things like that. But he is also an enforcer. In order to make sure that the first beast maintains its political power, he commands everyone on earth to make an image to it. He then mandates that everyone worship that image and finally demands that everyone receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The Wycliffe Bible Commentary explains this well by saying, while the first beast is undoubtedly a political power, the second beast, as Lee has said, is a spiritual world power, the power of learning and knowledge, of ideas, of intellectual cultivation, both are from below, both are beasts, and therefore they are in close alliance. The worldly anti-Christian wisdom stands in the service of the worldly anti-Christian power. The second beast enforces the commands of the first beast and accompanies his evil work with various forms of miraculous manifestations. The period of the times of the Gentiles began with the forced worship of an image set up by a powerful ruler by Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3, and this period will close with a similar enforced worship, this time on a universal scale. It's important to realize that this evil trinity of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet will not be easy to overcome. They're going to throw every trick in the book against us. But if we gain wisdom, and strengthen our faith in God, we can achieve the victory. Look at the example David set for us when he defeated the beast of a man named Goliath, whose height was six cubits, who wore six pieces of armor and carried a spear weighing 600 shekels of iron. For his story was more than just a Sunday school lesson. This example contains the key to victory. So learn how to count the number of the beast and be a Christian. Overcomer. Additional Bible studies are available on DVD, CD, and downloadable MP3s on our website at ChristianOvercomers.com. There you'll find studies such as the Children of the Wicked One, the Kenites, the Serpent Seed, America, the Last Stand on Earth, Three World Ages, Seven Years of Antichrist, Christians are Warriors, and many, many more. Simply go to ChristianOvercomers.com to acquire these studies in God's Word.